Now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Ready? Mm -hmm. All right. So, hi everybody out there. This is our Luna. Um, I'm Jose. Uh, I'm Jose Morales. I'm education coordinator and regional program coordinator with Epilepsy Foundation of Texas. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about seizure triggers. We have Dr. Rati Rashid here with us. Uh, so, let me give you a little introduction as to who we are and what we do. Uh, the Epilepsy Foundation leads the fight to overcome the challenges of living with epilepsy and to accelerate therapies to stop seizures, find cures, and save lives. We have programs for people with epilepsy, which include support groups, art therapy, education camps, and medical clinics. We see over 1,200 patients a year at our clinics for underinsured adults living with epilepsy. Support groups meet every second Tuesday of each month between the hours of 6 to 8. Our therapy is offered in Houston, Dallas, and West Texas. It's called Studio E Art Therapy. Uh, Patricia Cade is a contact. Uh, Transition meets one Saturday a month for teens and their parents. And we also offer three camps during the summer. Uh, that Those are headed up by uh, Suzanne Thomas. She is our camp director. Okay. Uh, so just some housekeeping uh, for folks joining us online or via webinar. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat box. Uh, we do have Ms. Rebecca here. She is my director. She's handling the tech today. Um, what else? Uh, the program by which we are able to provide and bring you these education events is being funded by the Health Resources and Services Administration. It's a federal grant that we have to help improve access to care for children and youth with epilepsy. Okay. Uh, in order to improve our program, we would like for you all to fill out an evaluation at the end of today's talk. These evaluations help inform of our progress and ultimately improve the information given to you. Uh, so now we'll go, we'll quickly, quickly go over the handouts that are in the folder. Um, so if you want to look at your handouts, you'll see one, the first big handout. Uh, so then we're going to go over the three sheets, the three big sheets. So the first big sheet you'll see uh, is about telemedicine. Uh, telemedicine is being able to access healthcare services via the internet, wireless services, and satellite and telephone media. It allows healthcare professionals to provide treatment uh, to patients at a distance through HIPAA secure video conferencing. For the patient, it reduces travel expenditures, time off of work or school, uh, and it reduces wait times. To find out more about providers that offer telemedicine, uh, you can add your information to the evaluation in your folder. The evaluation is the last sheet in the folder. Uh, you wouldn't be alone in looking into telemedicine as 74% of patients in the US say they would use telehealth services. Okay. So next, uh, the next big sheet you'll find is uh, on patient-centered medical homes. The medical home is best described as a model or philosophy of primary care that is patient-centered, comprehensive, team-based, coordinated, accessible, and focused on quality and safety. Uh, <laughs> so, so in addition to providing comprehensive uh, quality health care, your physician will ensure that preventative screenings are co completed, uh, care is coordinated with specialists when necessary, and chronic illness is effectively managed. Uh, Patient-centered medical home is a model of care that strengthens the physician-patient relationship. You will be encouraged to establish a relationship with a primary care phys physician your physician will lead a team of clinicians that are collectively responsible for providing your healthcare needs and arranging for appropriate care and other qualified with other qualified clin clinicians or specialists. Uh, in Texas, there are 754 patient-centered medical homes certified by the National Committee for Quality Assurance. Uh, please see your handout to find one near you. So the last uh, the last handout we'll go over is on transition planning. Transition planning is uh, means transitioning from pediatric to adult care for your child, okay? Uh, so transition planning, healthcare transition is the process of getting ready for healthcare as an adult. During childhood, parents usually help with medical needs, uh, meaning they call for appointments, they fill out forms, and keep track of medications. As youth get older, managing medical needs becomes their own responsibility. 
Achieving this independence requires an organized transition process to gain independent healthcare skills. Uh, you can go to www.gottransition.org for more information. We do offer, so as we went over uh, a little bit ago, and we do have some members here, we offer a transition education program during the school year at the Epilepsy Foundation in Houston, Dallas, and San Antonio. Uh, these are also live streams, so anyone can join the conversation. They will typically be held from October to May and meet one Saturday per month from 1030 to 1230. We discuss a wide range of topics, including access to social services, mentoring services, and ways to keep yourself safe while living with epilepsy. All right, so now we're going to introduce Dr. Rashid. Uh, so Dr. Rashid is a neurologist with subspecialty training certification in neurophysiology with a focus on epilepsy. He trained for his license at Northwestern University in Chicago and earned his subspecialty certification in neurophysiology with a focus on epilepsy from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, he currently works for, he currently works in the Southeast Houston area, Clear Lake area. And also we work together uh, once every two weeks. Uh, he is our epilepsy telemedicine clinic doctor. Uh, we see patients in Amarillo from our foundation's office at 2401 Fountain View. So today's very special. I've created a bond with Dr. Rashid uh, every two weeks or so. We hang out. He's super cool, super down to earth, and he's very knowledgeable. So, all right, Dr. Rashid, go ahead. Thank you. All right. No microphone. No microphone for me? No microphone for you. All right, guys. Um, I'll thank you all for coming. I appreciate your patience. Uh, I've been working with the Epilepsy Foundation in Amarillo in Michigan for about three years, and I've been working with them here, going on and continuing the teleneurology epilepsy clinic up in um, Amarillo from Houston. Uh, like he said, I have a clinic as well in the south part of Houston, uh, in some Webster, Texas, if you're interested, he has some business cards. Um, we're going to talk about seizure triggers today. También hago español, si hay preguntas en español, lo podemos hacer cuando terminamos de la presentación, la presentación, ¿ok? So when we also take the question and answer, it's a short presentation, but the question and answer will be broad and varied. It doesn't just have to be on seizure triggers, anything you guys have within my field, I'll be happy to answer. So let's get started. Seizure triggers, I'm sorry about the background. I didn't know it was going to come out looking like this. <laughs> Um, so first of all, we need to know what an epileptic seizure is. There's a lot of things that people will see that they will consider that will be described as seizures to physicians. Some of them are convulsions, convulsions when the when the muscles themselves are, the, are causing the problem, they shake. Some of them are loss of consciousness. There's a lot of things that can cause that, uh, hemodynamic instability, arrhythmias, uh, head traumas, not, none of those things are necessarily epileptic. What we're going to be focusing on today is epileptic seizures, which is when you have a a very electrical activity <laughs> that spreads and occupies normal areas of the brain, thereby changing the normal physiological functions of the brain. Okay? Basically, it's a short circuit. Your brain runs on electricity, and you have an abnormal discharge, and it wipes out the system, it takes over control of the system. Um, if you, you Seizures can cause convulsions, but it's not necessary. Seizures can cause you to lose consciousness, but it's not necessary. You can be awake during a seizure. Some seizures have aura as effect. Most seizures will probably, most patients with epilepsy will eventually have a seizure with, a, with an aura, about 60%. Um, but it's not necessary to have an aura. The only thing that we definitely need to meet the criteria for an epileptic event is the electrical activity in the brain being aberrant and spreading. Um, sort of seizures. These get described a lot, and we do know that about 30%, 30 to 35% of patients with epilepsy will also have pseudo seizures and vice versa. Similarly, patients with pseudo seizures will actually also have epilepsy as well. So not every single event in the patient with epilepsy is necessarily an epileptic event. This is important, but it, we're going to get down to similar things can trigger both of these events. So when we talk about it, it actually does matter about how to control these things. Um, but it really makes a difference on whether or not uh, their pseudo seizures are not in terms of medication treatment, but, but biological control, day-to-day -day efforts to control these events um, will, will, will be applicable to both of these kinds of things. Tics, they're, they're not seizures, and seizures, epileptic seizures will really cause something that looks like a tick, unless it's a subclass called the Jacksonian March, which starts in one part of the body and looks like a small tremor. Um, also, it can be epileptic, the only way to know again is back to the EEG. Um, 
So these are variations of abnormal movements that can come from the brain or not. Not everyone is a seizure, but again, we're focused on as the neurophysiology of it from class I as such. Huh, I wonder why. I guess this is worse than other. Okay. So why is it important that if you have a seizure, so a seizure, a tick, a convulsion, a syncope, all these events? It really doesn't matter. The, the, the truth is we need to get a diagnosis, we need to control them. Part of that control is avoiding triggers, and that's what this lecture is going to be about. And part of the control is appropriate medical therapy. <laughs> anti epileptic therapy does not treat syncopal events if the syncopal events are not caused by the brain. In fact, it can make it worse. anti epileptic therapy, depending on the seizure medicine you're using, can make pseudo-seizure worse. Um, depending on the seizure medicine you're using, ticks can get worse on anti epileptic therapy. So knowing the underlying cause of your, your event, the event that you're concerned about, is key. It's critical. Why is this important? Because just following seizure trigger avoidance techniques is not treating the underlying problem, okay? It'll help you control it, but it is not the solution. So it's important to realize that there's a difference, and this is, all of these things are true medical issues. They can all be addressed appropriately with appropriate medical diagnosis and whatnot. Sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes the work can take months or years before we get the right diagnosis, but it's worth it. It's worth it for your health. It's worth it for the health of, of the person who's having these events to, to yeah. persist and go through it. Actually, <laughs> All right, uh, most common things. In reality, it's really easy. These, these factors are the most common things that trigger seizures, and these are the things that we do when we're doing epilepsy monitoring. Um, when we get it in Cleveland Clinic, when we get it in Northwestern, when I do it now, in, I don't do it very much now, actually, because the, our hospitals in the South aren't really set up for it, but I used to do it in Amarillo. When we're trying to evaluate an underlying epileptic event, what we're trying to do is find where the seizure originates from because that guides us one, how to treat it properly with medicine, and two, whether or not surgical options are realistic endeavors here. Um, so we put them in the epilepsy monitoring unit, and we initiate these things to try to, wait, to, try to trigger an event. So, so the, nice, the, the opposite side of this point is that if you want to avoid an event, avoiding these things is probably a really good idea. Um, alcohol use is probably the most common thing that will trigger epileptic events. Um, in most people above above the age of about 30, it, the, the brain becomes less able to uh, withstand the toxicity from alcohol. And alcohol is toxic going into the brain, and it's toxic leaving the brain. So you can get it when you're drinking, you can get it when you're hungover, you can get it any time in between. Um, withdrawal from alcohol. So alcohol works as a sedative. It actually works on the same receptors as benzodiazepines and some of the sleep medicine we use. So when the alcohol's in there, it's sedating the brain, but when it leaves, all of a sudden, it's but drawing the sedative and that in itself can cause a seizure. Um, recreational stimulants, usually the stimulants are not really the ones that are depressants, but I've seen seizures also caused by opiates, so depressants can cause this as well. But cocaine, methamphetamine, um, thermogenics, we've seen a lot of this, um, and if they come and go depending on what, what's in style. I don't know if you guys know what a thermogenic is. Uh, patients who want to lose weight, patients who are in sports, patients who want to make weight, they sell these things at GNC, at vitamin shop, and whatnot. We don't know what's in them. Um, the people who make them say they say they know what's in them, but we really don't know what's in these things. And they come and go in waves. People become in a more than one kind of thermogenic, a stacker six or stacker three, are, are ones that I've seen in the past that cause rashes and seizures across the country, and then they get pulled from the market or changed, and then get a new one out. And we always there's always like six or ten of them in the market. Um, I I'm not a fan of them. I see seizures with a number of all of them. I'm not saying they're all cause epilepsy. But we just don't know what's in there, and they're almost invariably going to be stimulants. So we're back to this. We don't know what kind of stimulants. Uh, lack of sleep. So lack of sleep is probably across the board um, for all age groups. The biggest way, to, the easiest way to trigger a seizure. Alcohol for the older people, but a lack of sleep across the age groups. Um, your brain rests when it's sleeping, but if you're drowsy all the time, if you're always fatigued, then you're constantly transitioning from awake to sleep during the day. Every time you're getting drumming off or getting sleepy or drowsy or whatever, we can see that on your EEG. I can tell by putting an, uh, an EEG on somebody whether or not they're sleep deprived. And that transition period is the easiest time for an abnormal discharge to spread. And the spreading of that abnormal discharge is what will cause a seizure. When I have a patient in the epilepsy monitor unit, the way I try to trigger my seizures, I tell them to don't sleep. I have nurses bother them every two hours. I have somebody go into the room and knock on the door, turn on the lights, uh, and this is how we do it. This will trigger a seizure. Eventually, soon enough, if you take anybody who's normal, healthy, who's never had an epileptic event, if you apply these factors, the vast majority of people will eventually have a seizure. 
Um, so there's some other medicines that will interfere with seizure medication <coughs> by making you more susceptible to epileptic to epileptic events. Um, uh, tramadol, you can't really see I'm sorry, but that says tramadol right there. This is well butrin. Tramadol is a very common pain medicine. It is a um, semi-opioid uh, type of medicine, so for people who want to be on narcotics, this is kind of one step down. Uh, but it can trigger, it decreases your resistance to epileptic events. Well butrin, it's for anxiety, we use it as well for depression. Patients with epilepsy tend to have comorbid depression and anxiety. It, these things tend to run in clusters. So this is not, this unfortunately, this medicine is, is, is something that will make you more susceptible to seizures. So it's important to tell your doctor if you have epilepsy. Most of the doctors will normally have to do Eastern medicine. But it's something, you know, it really depends on the physician. But Eastern medicine is just to look into if you're on them, if you know something that's on them, they have epilepsy, these are good ones to avoid. Please. Is it, um, what did you say? Tramadol. Tramadol. Well, you drink bupropion. Okay. Well, you can not bupropion. So, well, bupropion is actually used now, um, as of last year, maybe two years ago. It's also on the weight loss club. Uh, it comes in a combination of other medications used to to decrease the appetite. Uh, and that's that goes into the whole anxiety component. <laughs> I'm sorry, that you can't see that. Well, you drink. Uh, benzodiazepines. So people get benzodiazepines for anxiety. Benzo uh, anxiety is very common. With epilepsy. Being on a lot of benzodiazepines is, is sometimes used also as an adjunct therapy to epilepsy, although it's not recommended by the American Academy of Neurology if it can be avoided, because missing a dose of benzodiazepine will send you into withdrawals and that will cause seizures. And a lot of the benzodiazepines you use clinically have very short half lives, which means if you miss a dose, which is if you're on a three times a day dosing, it's invariable that you're going to miss a dose. Um, people will, will often have seizures from withdrawal from any dose. Uh, what does this other one say? Oh, so I have left with well, missing your own doses of medicine, the seizure medicine. If you don't take your medicine, you're probably going to have a seizure. Um, isoniazid for tuberculosis is famous for causing seizures. Nitrofuratoin, which is a huge diagnosis, it's an antibacterial that we use for UTIs, famous for causing seizures. Venomycin, uh, that's Apexo, another, um, uh, another antidepressant, can decrease the seizure threshold. Okay, let's see what's next. So again, should that interfere with metabolism? So, most seizure medicines, not all of them, most seizure medicines are either metabolized in the kidneys or in the liver, which means that they're broken down and either made effective or made non-toxic by, by these organs. Medications that interfere with, with the hepatic metabolism will, will alter the way that the seizure medicines are working, either making them less effective. Yes, sir? Is asthma affect seizures? Asthma can, not that I know of, my friend, but so some medications we use for asthma um, are stimulants in and of themselves. The uh, butyrol inhaler will, will give you tremors. Those are not necessarily epileptic. Um, the other seizure, the other medicines used for asthma, most of them affect, most of them that we use are primarily directed at the lungs and are not absorbed throughout the body. Um, having said that, if you have really bad asthma attacks, one, that can trigger anxiety. Two, if it's interfering with your sleep, obviously we're back into the sleep deprivation of it. And then three, if you're not getting enough oxygen in your brain, which is what the, the, the problem with asthma ends up being, that, it, that can cause injury to the brain, which can cause seizures. So the short answer is not necessarily. The long answer is there's a lot of ways that asthma can affect um, your re resistance to epileptic events. Two questions. Um, the medications, I can't, I'm sorry, you can't really see these very well. The most common things that are gonna affect metabolism in the liver, uh, I don't know if anybody here has been on Coumadin in the past. Coumadin is a very common blood thinner until we've had the more recent blood thinners, the novel antidepressants is what we'll call it. Coumadin is very, very sensitive to liver enzymes, and so are seizure medications. They do not play well with each other. So when you're on Coumadin and on a seizure medicine, you can get very frequent blood tests to make sure the levels are therapeutic. Um, other medications that do this, in some patients, Lipitor will interfere with the way you're metabolizing. Lipitor is very commonly used. It will interfere with the way you're metabolizing some anti-epileptic therapies. Um, and so it should just be monitored. Most patients don't have that problem. There is genetic diagnostic studies that will tell you which enzymes you have, which seizure medicines will work better for you, and which ones which ones are probably won't be as effective at normal doses. The testing is expensive, but it is Medicare approved. You can ask your doctor about it. Um, most places don't have it yet, but it'll surely be rolling out in the next few years. These things are slow, but the progress is being made. Uh, medicines that affect cyclone P450, which is a very common enzyme, um, definitely will make those medicines less effective.
birth control pills make seizure medicine less effective, and the seizure medicine makes birth control pills less effective. So you end up having seizures and still pregnant. So barrier contraception is probably the way to go. <laughs> All right. Um, grapefruit juice tends to make seizure medicines toxic. Uh, it uses the same enzyme that most of these medicines go through. Um, and I've seen patients go from very well controlled to no problems at all on the seizure medicines, to ending up in the hospital with very high levels of toxicity just because of grapefruits. So don't eat grapefruits. This is my yes, please. Um, you know how you said the birth control? Yes. Um, I'm actually on depo for birth. Um, when I was on birth control, it was mixing my liver, the stages and stuff. So I either had really bad cycles or really bad um, uh, stages. So we actually pushed to get birth there. So and that is so that's exactly what happens. The birth control is less effective. The hormonal balance is not what you expect. It's not what you read on the box. So what you expect is not what you get. Your balance may vary. And your seizure medicine isn't as therapeutic as well. So you're, you're being hit on both sides with this. The problem is the toxicity, the, the fetal toxicity from seizure medicines. We can't predict what degree that happens. But if you're pregnant and you're still having seizures, and you're still on seizure medicine, it's, it's a trifecta of just bad disease. Um, there's other ways. There's, there's a lot of other ways to do birth control. I prefer, I'm a big proponent of the IUD. Uh, you can do the implantable one. The implantable one is still a hormonal therapy, and I would worry about it not being as effective. But at least it's less cyclical, and that's a big part of this because uh, people who've been on birth control know that the, the way the pills work is that they mimic different parts of your cycle at different times of the month, and so the dosage is changing throughout the month, and this is the, the whole time you're on it. And it's the alteration of these dosages, this, the inconsistency of these medicines that is that becomes more of a problem than just the consistency of therapy. Again, I'm a problem of value. Yes, please. What about dropping seizures? Like you just drop, like you can. Here. Those tend to be generalized epileptic events. Those are so those are hard to treat. They're very difficult to treat. Um, the medicines do work for them, but you've got to get on the right the correct medicine. The problem with drop attacks is there's two problems here. They're almost entirely resistant to any kind of surgical intervention, which is when you have trouble treating the seizure. Otherwise, that becomes plan. In most places, it's plan C. In my, in my mind, it's usually plan B. If the medicines don't work, talk about surgery. In drop attacks, that's that is not usually an option. There's new um, anti-epileptic surgical techniques. I do not know if they've studied it for drop attacks, where they implant the electrodes directly into the brain instead of on the vagal nerve, or doing the lesionectomy. And I know in the past they used to use corpus callos callosotomies, which is when they disconnect the brain um, from the middle, so that if you do have a seizure, instead of it spreading bilaterally and causing a, a, a whole body convulsion, it breaks it up and causes, instead of a whole body convulsion, a partial seizure. Um, those are things to look into, but we get back to the best way to, you know, avoiding triggers is important. Sleep deprivation is back to that one. It's probably the big one. Alcohol is probably number two. Um, stress can trigger seizures. Stress for two reasons. One, the pseudo seizures can easily be triggered by stress. But two, stress will decrease your ability to sleep well. And if you're not sleeping, we're back into main trigger of seizures. Um, medication. So we talked about sleep deprivation, alcohol, this medicine, alcohol, more toxic, that's what that. Sleep disturbances. A lot of the medicines we use to treat sleep disorders, narcolepsy, we use stimulants, sleep apnea, not sleep apnea, I'm sorry, insomnia, sleep cycle disturbances, we use sedatives. Um, a lot of these medicines will interact with the same neuroreceptors that anti-epileptics are supposed to work on. And sometimes when we do these things, we do get unpredictable events uh, down the line. So the best way to treat sleep disorders, when we're having sleep disorders affecting uh, epilepsy, is we do have a medicine called sleep medicine, a specialty services called sleep medicine. I don't, but they, they, it exists out there. Um, and there's there's daily behavioral ways that we can treat these things, and if those fail, seeing the specialist instead of just getting on Ambien or just getting on Tenazepam. Tenazepam is probably the biggest defender here. Getting on Tenazepam is probably a better way to go. Seeing a specialist who is more well versed in your options is probably better than just going with the first line of activity. The first line. Therapies we use, they're common, everybody's familiar with them. Most physicians across the board will be comfortable for them. But if your case is subtle or if it's a little bit different or a little bit more complicated, that's what specialists are for. And that'll be the time to walk into those options. I personally had patients who I've treated for epilepsy because of what we thought were drop attacks, actually, and she ended up being an narcoleptic. And that is treatable. Uh, it's treatable with actually the exact opposite of the message we were giving her. 
So she needed stimulants and she was getting sedatives. Sedatives, not sedatives, but she was getting anti-epileptic therapy where the primary side effect is sedation. So there's, it's important to get these things looked at. This goes back to one of my opening remarks. Sometimes the workup takes a long time. That's okay. This is complicated. If it wasn't complicated, we would have solved it by now. But not giving up is important. Being thorough in the diagnostic workup is important. Just because you have one answer doesn't mean you have the whole answer. You can have seizures and tics. You can have seizures and syndrome. You can have seizures and anxiety. These things can run together. Um, we're very complicated biological beings, and that's the way we're wired. We're not wired very well. We're wired very differently. Um, so having problems. If you notice you're not getting any benefit from your therapy, or if you think something has changed in the way your body's reacting to medicine or the way your, your seizures are behaving, that's a good time to say, hey, kid, we need another workout. Um, as we grow older, the way our seizures present tends to change. As we go from childhood to preteens, from preteens to adulthood, or to teenagers and then adulthood, um, you can grow out of seizures or you can begin to start having seizures. And the two most common times in life to develop epilepsy is before the age of, I think the number is six, but I'm going to use eight to be safe, and above the age of 60. There's a big U-shaped curve that even though you've never had a seizure before in your life, and one of the most common things I see the first time in my clinic, people coming in and saying, I'm 26, why is this happening now? I've never had a problem before. Well, you still, your brain still runs on electricity. If there's an abnormal something, it doesn't mean, you, as long as you have electrical activity in the brain, you can have abnormal electrical activity in the brain. That means you can't have a seizure. Um, so most people think seizures are the big convulsions. That's true, but there's many other variations of that. And most people think you have to be going with it. That's not true. You don't have to be going with it. Um, some people don't have triggers for their epilepsy. This is the sad, sad truth is this, the trigger avoidance works if you have the trigger. And I guess I didn't mention flashing lights. Flashing lights will trigger seizures in some people. And it doesn't work in everybody, but it does work in, in some patients with epilepsy, specific forms of epilepsy, especially those that start not so below the back part of the brain. Um, the, the truth is some people do not have triggers. They, they, can't, they just can't avoid it. We do know that patients with very, very difficult to treat medical, medically intractable epilepsy, that switching them to a ketogenic diet. I don't know how many of you guys know. But has, anybody, has anybody heard of a ketogenic diet? Okay. Okay. Yeah, some people. Switching them completely off of any kind of carb. I mean, this is hard to do. It's easier to do in children because we can control everything that goes into a kid. But once somebody is old enough to walk around and, and reach the cupboards on their own, it's, it's, it's almost always getting over at that point. But ketogenic. Diets will, will help control seizures. It's about a 60% reduction in epilepsy frequency and severity, which is a very good response, as long as you may maintain ketogenic state. Um, it's very complicated diet. Honestly, I, I can't do it off the top of my head. Um, I always have to send patients to a nutritionist to do it. Yes? Is that something that they have to stay on long-term yes. forever? No, it's very hard. Um, I've heard some people report um, <coughs> Modified ketogenic diets. So a modified ketogenic diet is, is, is something to modified ketogenic Definitely Atkins is a modified ketogenic diet. And I think the self-peak diet, maybe the paleo diet, don't quote me on the paleo one. I don't know enough about it. But there's modified ketogenic diet. Some people report some benefit to doing that. Um, the studies were not on those, so I don't think there's evidence of that. But if it's worth, I figured it probably won't hurt. It's worth a shot. Um, but that will help even if there's no other trigger that you can tell. The brain wants that glucose, the ketogenic diet switches to a ketogenic state in the brain, and that changes the way the brain uh, metabolizes uh, energy. It changes the way these cells are interacting with each other to such a way that it decreases the destruction of the electrical activity. Um, so there's some triggers that are benign. The flashing lights we talked about. I don't consider sleep deprivation benign, honestly. I do think that's in general pathological. It makes, it makes people more depressed, it gives you more blood pressure. Uh, but some things like flashing lights, some people are triggered by music. I've met one person who was triggered, who was, he believed he was always triggered by a certain kind of rock music. And I don't know if I believe that's true. I never had a lot of energy to it. But it's so, it's so easy to just avoid that kind of music in that case. Just avoid the trigger. If you think there's a trigger, you should avoid it. If you need to keep a diary, just keep a diary. You can. If you have frequent seizures, um, it's difficult to keep a diary about everything in your life all the time. If you have frequent seizures, um, when I say frequent, I'm saying more than two a week. A diary will be just monitoring your food and events. A diary needs to be monitoring you know, entertainment and events. A diary will be monitoring sleep and events. And you can see if there's a correlation, then you can pursue that correlation. Monitoring everything in your diary all the time is it's really impossible because you don't know what the trigger might be. I know weather patterns changing 
do affect neurological function. Um, classically, in, in my profession, uh, neurologic form headaches and neurologic, trigeminal neuralgia, occipital neuralgia, even sciatica is affected by weather. And these are all neurological disorders, the way the cells act. So we know that it affects the peripheral nervous system. It surely must affect the central nervous system as well. So a lot of these things can happen. Um, what else? Okay, this one's a big one. Fevers, inflammation, concussions, infections, pain, inflammatory diseases, and any kind of cortical disruption. Um, I see a little football player there. Is a little, do you play football? Yeah. Oh, Lordy. <laughs> so, bad for your head. <laughs> it's really bad for your head. Playing football is bad for your head. Anything that's bad for your head is bad for teachers. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, that's the cortical disruption. Concussions don't have to cause seizure at the time of onset. But um, we do know, and this becomes more and more well known, even a single concussion can trigger a pathological state called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. When we see progressive disruption of the cortical neurons and the way they interact with each other going down the line, it can last years, and it can be progressive throughout those years, even after one, although usually you need more than one. That can trigger seizures. Inflammatory diseases, uh, lupus, arthritis, lupus, um, hmm, is that all I can come up with? Vasculitis, I'm sure I can come up with one after a minute. But some inflammatory disorders, usually what we're seeing is inflammation in the blood vessels or in the connective tissue. Your brain has a lot of both of those things. And it doesn't always affect the brain. Histologically, the brain, even the, brain, the blood vessels in the brain, and once you pass the cranium, the histology of the blood vessels changes. So just because you have a vasculitis or a arthritis or something else, it doesn't really necessarily will affect the brain. But if it does, it can trigger seizures. Uh, pain. This is classic. So we look. I'm sorry, go ahead. Can you think dysautonomia and uh, curiosity? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So dysautonomia is a neurological disorder, usually a neurological disorder, or cardiologists can also diagnose it, where your brain, the autonomic nervous system, um, is, I'm not going to say this quite, but the, usually it's a neuroreceptor problem, where your autonomic nervous system is working. Most common symptoms dry now, uh, constipation or diarrhea, lightheadedness when you stand up, blood pressure fluctuations that are fairly apparent. And, Again, we're back to talking about neurophysiological principles. The brain is being affected. All the medicines we use treat your brain matters. All they treat the way the brain's electrically wired. So I do think you can have um, seizures with dysautonomia. Having said that, the blood pressure fluctuations can cause syncope, and syncope can cause convulsions. It's important to treat what you actually have, and that's why the workup is so important. Okay? But yes, the short answer is yes. Pain disrupts sleep. People in chronic pain when we do EEGs on them. I can tell when you're sleeping on an EEG. People in chronic pain when you do EEGs on them, they have a uh, preponderance of alpha rhythms even during sleep, which are not supposed to happen. So we know they're not sleeping well. Even when they're asleep, we know they're not sleeping normal. So there's there's sleep is something even if it looks like they're sleeping. People are taking medications to induce sleep, their brain is no different. They're not sleeping normal. This is not the same physiological sleep we expect. So pain medicines, sedatives, yes, ma'am, please. So you said okay, that, I love you. Good. You said that sleep deprivation can impact the seizures. Yeah, and absolutely. If he seems like he's asleep but not really asleep, how do you get him to have sleep that so not gonna trigger the seizures? He's gonna. So how, what does sleep but not really asleep mean? Well, like they did the EEG. Uh -huh. He was getting seizures awake and asleep. So if he's having seizures while he's asleep. He's not really getting. Mm -hmm. So he's not convulsing, is what you're saying. He, he has fatigue on seizures. Yeah, so he's not convulsing. No. He's having seizures. So there's medications that treat all seizures. And de depending on the. So I don't know how, how many seconds they would use. We would use a, an eight second rule for our fatigue on seizures in the clinic. If you're not active, there's a period of time when the. It looks like he's having a seizure on the EPG, but they're still interacting for a period of time until it hits a few seconds into the seizure. Depending on how severe they are, there are medicines that treat it, there are surgical interventions that are possible, and there are increasingly more surgical interventions. Although, again, deep ball is a generalized epileptic state. You can't just take out the piece that's got some problems. Um, but honestly, the EEG is the only way to know if he's sleeping well, and if he needs to see a sleep specialist to see if there's something they can do to help him sleep better, to decrease the, the, the drowsiness or the disruption in his normal sleep cycle, it might be worth doing. Uh, the, the other thing, too, the second part of that is that my uh, father-in-law has sleep apnea. Yes. So that is that. Correct? Yes, sleep apnea causes sleep disruptions. We know that it's probably the most famous thing that causes sleep disruptions. 
Treating that helps not just seizures, helps blood pressure, helps depression, helps diabetes. Sleep apnea is much more pathological than we let, than we let it be known, than people seem to think it is. Okay? It helps people lose weight, it helps people with all kinds of other medical problems. And chronic pain too. So, so I need mama, you guys go up to you guys, are you serious? Get another mama! <laughs> get another mama. Before we leave today, we're going to get another mama. Okay. <laughs> swimming. No, not swimming. Okay, no swimming. All right. Uh, infections. UTIs, especially in elderly people, but also in little kids. Uh, do you know, David, know what febrile seizure is? All right, seizure with fever. <laughs> Good question. So, a febrile seizure in infancy doesn't necessarily mean you can have epilepsy all your life. Um, however, if it causes the scarring in the hippocampus, it does increase your risk of having seizures going forward. These are temporal sclerosis. I'm referring to. I just had a patient who had a febrile seizure as an infant who just turned 21, 22, and started having a lot of seizures all of a sudden, out of nowhere, out of blue. Um, I, we did the EGs. The EGs are normal. As anybody who has epilepsy who can tell you, most EGs are normal most of the time. We did them around and found temporal sclerosis, and that fits. Like, well, she has a about seizure. She has MTS. She has surgical options now. Um, but we also know that MTS makes it harder to treat seizures adequately with antiepileptics. So we're going to be very aggressive when we're treating with medicine. But she fails three medicines, then we're moving towards surgery. Um, but that should take us six months. We should know in six months. Um, that's how aggressive we should be with these things because the seizures themselves cause brain damage. Taking out the seizure focus will limit that. And infection, oh, by the way, UTIs in elderly people, patients who've never had a seizure before will get a UTI during a tract infection, and then they'll have a seizure. And one of the reasons for that is one of the medicines we use to treat UTIs, and the pain in the UTI is lipoproteinuria and tramadol. So we give them two things that will increase the seizure, the seizure threshold, plus they have an infection, and there, there they go. All right, uh, head traumas. We talked about this, but yes, yes, I'm sorry. I, about, I know a lot of times she's she's kind of starting to grow out of it now, but in the past, ten days with the vaccination, she'll have seizures. So vaccines will trigger the autoimmune response, and it is likely that they're triggering the response in the brain as well. Your brain does have autoimmune cells of their own, the astrocytes or the immune system of the brain. I have patients with neurological, other neurological illnesses, multiple sclerosis, I have patients with tri transverse myelitis, I have patients with myasthenia gravis, who have Guillain-Barre syndrome. So these are all neurological disorders who have responses to vaccines that are pathological. I tell those patients don't do it anymore. As you know, we've been told do it because it's better to have the seizure after the vaccine than would, to have the febrile big. I would talk to the specialists. I tell them, depending on how bad the seizure is and how long they last, or if they cluster, if it's, it's status epilepticus, it depends on that. I've had the myasthenic patients who get worse after uh, myasthenic, myasthenic graphs, autoimmune disease that causes diffuse weakness. They can't breathe. Um, I've had patients who get worse and it causes paralysis. I, I keep them away from vaccines. I'm a big promoter of vaccination in every other case. Every other case. Big, I'm not vaccinated. Vaccinate my kids, vaccinate my mom, vaccinate my brothers, vaccinate all my patients. Unless it makes them worse. Yes. Usually, um, um, when it happened, I would have like um, it would be um, it would be like an acne seizure. Of oh, some seizures, I, I wouldn't worry too much about, but you can increase the medicine in that period of time. So there's different options. This is why specifics. You sit down with the doctor, you talk to them. But it depends on risks versus reward. If you went into status epilepticus, status epilepticus of convulsive event more than five minutes. Or multiple events without return to baseline, you, you, usually we use one hour or three hours. I would say any amount of time, if you don't return to baseline afterwards, that's status of love, it's now treated as such. You can use, during periods of time when you're at increased risk, let's say, let's say you know you're going to a wedding, for example. You're going to be safe to drive because, and you're going to be drinking because it's a wedding. There's going to be loud noises and flashing lights because you're marrying, I don't know, somebody who likes house music, I don't know. So you're going to a wedding and then I don't know. So you know there's going to be a problem. You can increase your medications, or you can rid yourself with benzodiazepines for a period of time when you're increasing risk of having a seizure. I had a patient who was who would have seizures every day the first day of her period or her, of her cycle, her period, menstrual cycle. That day I would give her benzos. I don't use benzos for normal therapy. I would not give them prescribed take benzos every day. But if we know this is the day that it happens, that's the day you should be on. And if it can prevent it, then great. Then we then we solve the problem. Yes, ma'am. Like, uh, pear fruit juice. Uh, pear fruit juice is bad. <laughs> Boy, don't drink pear fruit juice. <laughs> like, I mean, because I've tried all sorts of diet 
and it's going to help with my uh, <coughs> uh, features to mm -hmm. keep down and mm -hmm. I'll be doing like pop it, but usually it just uh, lasts probably like um, first few months and then it like sort of goes away, like it doesn't like uh, control my experience that well. From my experience, no. so you're saying that grapefruit, um, grapefruit juice is for some reason grapefruits, not oranges, not lemons, not limes, just grapefruits. Use an enzyme in the liver that your that your seizure medicine needs to use to. We don't know why this why just that one type of fruit because it's in a family of a bunch of other fruits that don't seem to have that problem. Um, but as far as diet, um, the ketogenic diet, so. Basically, a pure protein diet, and you can find variations of it online, has been shown to help but not cure. So, a reduction of 60% of seizures is, is basically what we're looking for in the ketogenic diets. Yeah, because I tried the ketogenic diet for one year, but it only helped probably the first few months, and then it sort of like also went like, away and not really. Yeah. Anything. One of the problems we run into with epilepsy um, is that the brain is always learning, making new connections, and breaking up old connections. And the thing, and we see patients on seizure medicines that work for years or for months, and they suddenly stop working. The theory is that you still have, so the pathological area that's causing the seizures initially, it's still there, we haven't taken it out. The medicines control the connections, the ketogenic diet changes the way these things function, but then it's still there. If it reconnects invariably, it's able to short circuit again and take over, then you get seizures. The brain is not a static organ. I don't think any organ, I don't know, I'm not a, anything specialist except for the brain, but definitely brain. Every time you learn something new, you're never too old to learn something new. Every time you forget something, you're definitely never too old to forget something. That's a connection that was there that's not, or a connection that was there was disrupted, or some other variation of the way your brain works. Um, consciousness, when you go to sleep and you wake up, those are changes in neurotransmitters, changes in cycles, changes in, in the physiological activity of your brain. That's why when I do the EG, I can tell, by uh, looking at you, if you're asleep, awake, stage two sleep, stage three sleep, stage four sleep, REM sleep, because the pattern of electric activity has changed. This is constant. That's what it's supposed to be. And so you can become resistant to seizure medicine because you're always making these connections. And you can maybe develop, that's why you can also go out of seizures. The pathology is still there, the connections are different. I wouldn't recommend definitely not giving up, keep working at it. If it worked for a while, you can always try it again. I would definitely recommend it. The other diets have not been studied. Um, the ketogenic diet has been studied, it has been shown to be effective, more effective than chance. Um, so I, I try trying, but if you want to try other diets as well, I don't think any of them have been shown to be pathological towards epilepsy. Yeah, because I've also tried the um, gluten-free diet, mm -hmm. like that, and it just, it helped a tiny bit, but um, not as much as the ketogenic yeah. diet. So. And that's a good time also to keep diaries. And so the other diets, every change you do can affect the way your brain responds to the environment. Um, so I, I, I'm a believer in, in, in the scientific method. If you want to do science on yourself, take notes and see what helps, and you can go back to it in the future. Um, anecdotes are not evidence, though, so uh, not against the gluten diet. I know there's a lot of anecdotes about gluten-free diets helping with X, Y, and Z. Um, the evidence, in my understanding, again, not my specialty, is lacking. I know multiple sclerosis, some people say it helps, some people say it doesn't. Um, there's been studies, and there's actually physicians who are proponents of dietary changes to control multiple sclerosis. The reason I bring this up, MS is a neurological disorder, so it's epilepsy. Things that affect one probably affect the other one. We're talking about the same organ system. Um, but I don't have evidence, and I'm not I'm not going to just make stuff up. I know fresh food is poison. Oh, that's not good. I'm going to big grip this week in that dress. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I have a question. Do you have any questions? Could you explain some of the uh, doctors? will say like the honeymoon effect and drug Yes. Effect. So the honeymoon effect, we see this with a lot of medicines. Once we start medications initially, um, and this the drug drug guy is probably not going to enjoy this. Mm. Once you start a new medicine, or start, especially if it's novel agent, an agent you haven't been on a similar agent as in the past, you usually get better control initially. And and this can last weeks, this can last months, and it comes back to the same reason we were talking about with this young lady. Your brain is always making new connections and, and destroying old connections, constantly, constantly, constantly doing this. And so when you come at this this problem, this old problem, an abnormal electrical activity spreading, and you start knocking out sodium channels instead of calcium channels, or T-type cell receptors instead of you know GABA receptors, 
you're constructing those, those same connections are constructed in a different way that can give you a benefit from a new seizure medicine that may not last forever. Um, and that's not even, especially with a novel agent. And we see this every time a new seizure medicine comes out. And I have my new seizure medicine buddy right there. When Vimpat came out, everyone was like, this is it. Vimpat's doing the job he needs to do. And Vimpat works very well. I'm not pushing for Vimpat or anything here. Um, I like it, but I'm not, he's not paying me to say this. It worked well. But then after it's been out for a while, we start seeing patients that are now somewhat resistant to Vimpat. So you have to start switching the game again. This is important. The reason this is important is that one, you don't give up. There's, there's always new uh, agents out there. Always. There's new agents come out periodically. You can come in cycles. Um, two, every once in a while, a very novel agent will come out. Right now, the, the one that comes to my mind is Icomba. It works differently from every previous seizure medicine we've had. And so I do expect to get a lot of honeymoon effects with Icomba that I did not see with other medications. And I actually have a friend in, uh, who used to work in Oklahoma, now is in Dallas. Was from Cleveland Clinic as well. Was a was a huge proponent of my company. He was speaking for them, doing all these things for like two years. Then he's like, ah, oh, forget it. Does it stop working the way he wanted it to? And it's not because it stopped working. It's because the brain rewired. And now the seizures are now resistant to this new medicine. So what happens? You stop the medicine, you switch to a different agent, give yourself some time off of it, and then you go back because this whole time your brain is rewiring again. So when you go back to it again, you can get the same honeymoon effect with the same old medicine that you didn't have for a while. The idea is not to give up. There's no reason to give up on these things. We have ample agents. We have, is there 27 antibiotics out there now? There's some 20 plus antibiotic agents. And this is vastly different. Honestly, um, until the late 80s, I believe there's only like seven. So we had a huge wave of new seizure medicines. And not just new, not just variants of old ones, which is something we see a lot. But novel agents, Keppra, Riviac, Ficampa, Vanzel, these are absolutely new medicines. Different from everything we've had before. Uh, Clobazam is an old medicine used in Canada and nearly from the United States. We did not have an agent that worked like that. The closest, the closest similar agent would have been the benzos. Um, so there's new options out there. And this is another reason where I'm, I'm promoting myself here, but another reason you don't have to come to me. I'm really far in the south. It's really a long drive. Um, but it's a but the go to a specialist will be more, he will know more seizure medicines. Then a general neurologist was, uh, uh, and not, nothing against the older generation of physicians, but my mom's a physician. She probably knows three seizure medicines. Because um, when she practiced, she practiced in the, in the early 90s. That's when she stopped practicing actively. That's probably the most common seizure medicines. If you go to any emergency room in the country today with a seizure, you're probably going to get older than Kepra. I don't know if you all have been seen to, uh, to, to EDs recently. They'll be older than Kepra. If you've gone to any emergency room in the in any emergency room in the country, Ten years ago, you surely would have been older than that guy. Hundred percent chance. And, and Kepler was around then, but people didn't know about it. He, our doctors, working in the field, didn't know about it. But this information spreads. It gets into the the the, the bloodstream of medicine, and these things will spread. And eventually, you'll probably even that. If Vimpat has an IV formulation, Vimpat works. Um, therapeutic, you reach therapeutic threshold very quickly. So, if before that, it was never thought. These things are just things that we can do. That we can do new that we couldn't do before, but the specialists are aware of it before the general population. And I've had patients go to the emergency room with medicines that the emergency room doctor is not even aware of what they are, and he'll stop the medicine even when they come in with seizures because he just doesn't know what it is. And the safest thing to do is be conservative. The most conservative thing to do when you come in with epilepsy from the emergency room is stop any new medicine that was started, stop making you know what it does, load them on camera, and give them benzos. And I don't blame them if somebody came to me with a heart attack. Up to the one aspirin, give them oxygen, give them morphine. I don't know if that's still what you're supposed to do. It definitely was when I was training, but I know these things change. Okay? Hands? I'm sorry. Does it have side effects? Which? The medication? Everything has side effects. Mm -hmm. Even very poisonous. I'm sorry. It, it depends on the patient. Yeah, so every medication has side effects. Class effects of anti epileptic drugs across the board. You get dizzy, not everybody. Some people get dizzy, some people get groggy, some people get lethargic. Some of them will cause headaches, some of them cause weight gain, some of them cause weight loss. The ones I would worry about is liver dysfunction, kidney problems, bone marrow abnormalities. That's uh, the older generations, but that can cause osteoporosis, nephrocal causes liver dysfunction, causes hypermonemia. Vimpat causes dizziness, Vimpat causes lightheadedness. Um, I've seen extreme lethargy with Clobazam, with the uh, with Onfi. That's the one I was, I was tapping a little while ago. With Ficampa, again, the newer medicine I was talking about that my friend is a big fan of. 
I've seen nocturia where people started wetting their beds for some reason, getting a lot of urinary tract infections. Is it an anecdote or is it true? If you look at the side effect list, these things happen. We report everything, and if we see more than placebo, we say it's in a side effect. Um, but given how these medicines work, they all work in the brain. Most of them work by slowing down some kind of receptor, some kind of connection, some kind of channel. Expect dizziness, expect lightheadedness, expect some degree of confusion. It's, the, it's a class effect. We're trying to slow down this electrical activity. Doing that is going to slow down other electrical activity. But people respond differently. If you don't have a good response to one, it does not mean you won't have a good response to another one. Giving up is definitely not the way to, to pursue this. And keep trying. Let's see. Dr. Shi, there's a lot of questions online. Is there really? Jesus. Yes. How many people are on there? Um, right now, there's 14 live. Is there, can somebody send the link to this one to me? Yes. 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 Um, so, so the, okay, let me, let me see what's next. I think okay. you have questions. Yes. All right. All right. Perfect. <laughs> um, so the first one's from Savannah. She said, my daughter is six years old and had seizures since two, um, but I don't know why she gets them. She has stage, she's a stage four epileptic, which she has a question about why a doctor is calling it stage four. Which doctor? Um, yeah. Savannah, can you just ask? What kind of doctor? Yeah, what kind of doctor are you? Are you doing? Doing? I'm not sure yet, so I'll have her write in um, what it is. But she says she also has to take meds to sleep. It has affected her learning and speech. Yeah. Her doctor has increased her meds if she needs to. That's as far as we've gotten so far. So she's asking a question on what the stage four epileptic means. I do not. Okay. Um, so I, I don't stage epilepsy like that. I stage epilepsy centers, so maybe he's implying that she needs to go to level four epilepsy center. Okay. Um, I can expand on that. A level, the difference, uh, I think level three epilepsy center has neurologists available. They can do uh, lesion activities. They do vagal nerve stimulators. Um, and they do medical management. Level four epilepsy centers, which are few and far between, um, they do intracranial monitoring. They do, they can do laser therapy uh, or gamma knife therapy, which are the same thing. Um, and they do very high level, high risk procedures. Uh, you know, again, these are the riskiest, these are the hardest patients, the hardest ones who have not been appropriately solved in other places. Um, but I am a big believer, and if things haven't worked out, giving up is not going to fix it, then yeah, find a level for epilepsy center and, and let them have a go at it. Um, they, it's a big risk, big reward. It's basically, this is, this is the, the time. That's when you go and you get all your men on the field, you, you fight the last battle and see if you can win. <laughs> it's a hard battle, and you don't win all the hard battles. Um, but giving up is not gonna does not you anything. All right. Um, let me see. I have another Can one. <laughs> Crystal. <laughs> Crystal. Um, she said, "What is the relationship between narcolepsy and seizures, uh -huh. and is there such a thing as narcoleptic seizures?" Yes. Well, no. <laughs> so um, you can have narcolepsy. You can have epilepsy at the same time. Um, I mentioned earlier, I don't know when, when Crystal logged in here, I did have a patient in Amarillo who was being treated for seizures for years who ended up having narcolepsy. And when we switched, again, this is the workup, this is where the workup comes in. When we switched treatment paths, our narcolepsy got better because she was now off of seizure medicine, which made her more fatigued, and she was now on stimulants, which we wouldn't have done before epilepsy. And she took a horseback ride, which I strongly disagreed with. <laughs> but it was true, if you know what you have, if you truly have narcolepsy, and there's tests for that, and you truly have epilepsy, there's tests for that. Both can be treated under their own pathways. Um, uh, you, uh, what I'm guessing is a narcoleptic seizure is what she said? Yes. A narcoleptic seizure, so what I would guess is that you probably, when you fall asleep, you can have um, hypnagogic or hypnopompic jerking, which uh, depending on the observer would say is a convulsion. And it really is a convulsion, but not all convulsions are epileptic. Um, you can similarly get syncopal convulsions. It's an ICD-9 code, it's an ICD-10 code. It is a thing um, that you pass out and you convulse. That is not necessarily, it could be a seizure, but it's not necessarily a seizure. Um, I would get it tested. And if you have two things, treat them both. If you have one thing, focus on that. And they are very different therapies. So treating one will not necessarily help if you're treating the wrong one. Okay? Great. Um, let's take one more online. Do you mind? I'm sorry. Okay, um, Courtney, I don't want to be like that. she said, my son has Rolandic epilepsy, yes. and his seizures are getting worse instead of better. He is on multiple medications along with CBD oil. The seizures typically get worse on weekends. I burn a lot of candles at home. 
can candles or different smells be a trigger? Yes. Anything that will affect the way the brain is interacting with the environment, which um, olfactory stimulation, interestingly enough, Olfactory stimulation is the only route of stimulation to the brain that does not first go to the balance. So that is a direct cortical stimulant. Um, I would add, I mean, uh, I would stop burning the candles and I would see. Or, you know, you get candles that are, on, that are electric. Mm -hmm. If you really like candles, you do that. Um, but yeah, so the only, the only neurostimulation you can get without going to the thalamus first is factory stimulation. And I absolutely, we're stimulating the cortex, and so, Relentic epilepsy is supposed to be um, temporal parietal or temporal central kind of epilepsy, which the temporal lobe is close to the mesial frontal lobe. And so here's the olfactory stimulation triggers directly into the lobe, goes straight up. Not really, but back in <laughs> but, um, but yes, it could. I would stop and see. We'll get back to the candles. Same thing. What is. Because she's been in the past diagnosis mode, I don't know if she still does, and we're going through a lot of trial and error right now with some different different things. What is, how do you know the difference, besides the EEG, is there a way to know the difference between a pseudo seizure and a seizure? Yes. Um, now, so this is not 100%. Let me put this out there. True epileptic seizures tend to be very uniformly, they tend to follow the same pathway over and over again. Patient goes to the left, shakes, and falls down, or whatever, or stares. The reason that is because in most cases, and not in all cases, especially if you have bad epilepsy, in most cases, the abnormal, the abnormal area trick in the brain starts in the same area, it tends to follow the same pathway, so you, you get the same symptoms and events. Um, we, in medicine, we call it seminology. The seminology of the seizure should give you a very good idea of where it's coming from. And in most cases, when you have a similar seminology, that is a true epileptic event. Uh, pseudo seizures, however, can have a lot of different manifestations. Um, having said that, I get I have a lot of caveats here. Some famous epilepsy syndromes, Lennox Gastaut syndrome has is a multifocal epilepsy syndrome. We get a lot of different kinds of seizures, and they're truly they're all truly epileptic. And I've seen in my own practice, especially when I was in Cleveland, uh, which is the level four epilepsy center. Again, this is where it comes down to. We had a patient who was sent to us for pseudo seizures. Um, when we did the intracranial monitoring, we did the monitoring on the outside, we found nothing. We put electrodes on the inside and we found something. She was seizing, it would never get to the cortex that we could record. And so we found that the super seizures in this patient were actually truly epileptic events. Okay? So aggressive management is, is important. If we notice stress triggers, stress triggers can trigger both, but stress triggers can affect pseudo seizures very much more aggressively. So if you notice that there's, there's that correlation, that is something to be concerned about. And there's some medicines that treat epilepsy that will help with even pseudo seizures. Trilepto comes to mind as one that, and Lomito, both of the mind is medicines that we frequently use to treat mood disorders, anxiety problems, bipolar disorder, that are all also related to pseudo seizure effects. So there's options. Um, monitoring is important. If you're seeing the same semiology and same presentation over and over again, I would, I would treat that as a seizure to improve another one. If you're seeing different manifestations, then that might be more sort of seizure than not. She'll, she she is going through a lot of stress and a lot of mm -hmm. um, emotional yeah. di differences going on, a lot of about emotional medication, you know, yeah. things like that. And I'm getting a lot of, um, she's very dizzy, or That's if nice. I just don't feel good. My body's not with me, my body's not here, I don't feel good. Yeah. She has had serious seizures in the past. Yeah. So now we get to the different area here. I have been, my friend here, Ross, no, what? Was it Ross? No. Yeah. Anyway, he, so when he's been in clinic with me um, a few times now, one of the biggest concerns I have with patients on multiple therapies and experiencing these kind of vague things, dizziness that I don't, I feel like hey, I feel a little bit confused. It comes and it goes. I have a lot of deja vu. These things can't be epileptic. They can be side effects for the same medicines you're taking. And so my bigger concerns at this point is check toxicity levels. Are you when you're having these events, are you having are your levels much too high or higher than they're supposed to be? Um I know her trilepsal, she's maxed out. More maxed out on the doses, but what is it in her blood? In the blood, she's maxed out. Okay. It's so that could be the problem. Trilepto is famous for causing dizziness. Okay. And any seizure medicine. My mom takes carbamazepine for neurological disorder. Um uh, does that is that happen? No, she's not. So it's not uh, information. <laughs> so she takes uh, medicine for a neurological syndrome. Um, and when she's on high doses, she's groggy and confused. 
and she's on overdose, she's a physician. Uh, medicines, obviously, are going to affect the way your brain functions because they're medicines that target the brain. Um, check the levels, adjust, 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 and see if you can find a sweet spot where you're functional and not having seizures, but also not toxic. I think the side effects, the issue that is so difficult is you're going to find people who have side effects that it causes insomnia, it yeah, causes sleepiness, so, it causes no, nausea, so. it causes this, it causes, you know, it, it's like you get the... All of that is absolutely true. It does all of it. it they do all of that. The brain is wonderfully complex or, or dangerously complex. And what you're doing is we're not targeting specific areas in the brain. We're not trying to reduce specific neurotransmitters or neuron clusters. We're just targeting with trilocal specifically. It's a calcium setting channel blocker. It's a channel blocker of some sort. Every single cell in the brain has that. Even the cells in the heart use that. So you're knocking out a system that is used widely trying to, tra trying to treat a specific problem. Um, and it's difficult to do so. It's like getting whole body radiation for cancer. Yeah, you'll get the cancer, but you now your whole body's been ready. You know, you'll get the side effect. Come on, and then we'll move you, and then we'll go back on. Okay. Um, so Shannon says, my son has been having seizures every two months. He only has them at night as he is coming out or going to sleep. Yes. Is it possible there is something building up over time that causes the seizures? The pattern is interesting to me. His first year of seizures, they were all over the place, but the past year, it's gotten into an every two month pattern. I mean, is it two months? Can they, can they, can they write it? Can they do it by, can they calendar it? Can they predict that? And how old is the kid? Um, okay. I will ask that and we'll get back to you. <laughs> uh, well, I'll answer right now. Okay. Um, I don't know if he's building something up at his body. Is he on seizure medicines? The, the seizure medicines might be affected by the diet. There, he might be building up or he might be missing the dose or he might be metabolizing better. We were talking about the honeymoon period earlier. He might be building up tolerance to this and have a breakthrough seizure. And maybe they'll adjust the medicines or maybe not. Um, Two and, months, give or take a few days, no meds. Age? Uh, what's, okay. So the other thing is, as he's growing up, as, 15. He's, as he's growing up, he's making new connections, he's developing his frontal lobe, there's more neurotransmitters sloshing around in there, and since he's 15, his hormones are changing, and that is part of the pituitary hypothalamic adrenal axis, and two parts of that axis is in the head, is in the brain. Um, so there's things changing in him, there's hormonal changes that are happening, if they're, men are not nearly as cyclical as women in that sense, but we have our own cycles, we have circadian rhythms, we have sleep wake cycles. So, yes, there's something going on. If you can predict them, you can probably break the cycle by putting them on medicines just for that time. You would need to have a quickly therapeutic therapy to fill them up three days beforehand, and then you can take them up three days afterwards and see if you can stop that cycle. Then, if you can not, if he does not have seizures for a few months, you might be able to stop the medicine, you may not, never have seizure again. That is not a that's not American technology recommended therapy, but that's what I would do in my in my practice. And then see if it works. But that's not guidelines, by the way. That's not guidelines. But I would do that for sure. Other thing is if you can predict it, put them on EEGs to make sure they're seizures. Please, work. Somebody have an So he is the guy then, and he's on ethosetamide. That's what he wants to Two hundred and fifty milligrams. Hmm? He takes three in the morning, mm -hmm. three in the evening. Mm -hmm. He gets them daily. You, know you can add another medicine. Ethosuximide is our go-to option for fatigue mal events. Um, it does not work for any other kind of seizure. Um, you can add another agent to that. Difficult. We also use for fatigue mal seizures. I don't think we make them worse. So there's, you again, we're not a specialist, but there's other medicines that can be added. The other thing is, are all his? How do you know he's having an event? Where did he go by the way? Did he he went to the bathroom. Okay. So. <laughs> so um, He's doing something, he just stares. And, okay. he'll, and he started here lately, just kind of like, sometimes he'll do this to the lips, mm -hmm. and then sometimes he'll just do his fingers like this. Uh, and he just has to get out of it, and then he's just back to normal. Yeah. But he's having this several times uh, a day. Uh, it's impacting his school. Yes. Uh, he, I can't get him to memorize some words, his spelling. Yeah. Yeah. Are horrible. I would absolutely, if I was his physician, I would absolutely add another agent at this point um, and see if that controls them better. Um, if, he, if he fails two or three agents, I would absolutely consider a vagal nerve stimulator. He can't get intracranial surgery because I think multi are not local epileptic events. 
They're generalized epilepsy events. And I know the big epilepsy simulator is approved for partial complex epilepsy, but it does help with generalized epilepsy. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of non medical guideline stuff here. <laughs> but you can help. I don't know, you're the doctor. <laughs> my recommendation is I speak for myself, but I would absolutely, if you tell two medicines, I would consider the vagal nerve stimulator. Where is that? Uh, it's a little simulator device. They, they punch in the chest like a defibrillator. They run a, a wire to the um, vagus nerve in the neck, almost always on the, always on the left side. I've never seen the little bit <laughs> It provides um, neurostimulation at a regulated period of time. And the idea, we've seen the studies where patients go from having um, I'm not going to use numbers. Where patients have a decrement in their seizure frequency, you have to about 70% over the course of about five years. And so yeah. it works. It's not a cure, but it works as a very it works as a very good adjunct therapy. He's failing medicine and he's having problems. He's young now. He can get out of any rut he's in right now. He still looks, I don't know, 10? He's 11. Still young. Still young. So he, this is the time to be aggressive with it because he, you know, in five years he's going to want to drive. Yeah, five years he's going to want to drive. And, Five years after he's going to get, get a job and get married and all these things, be aggressive now because he can afford it now. He can afford to be aggressive now. Later, when things get more complicated, life just gets more complicated. Okay. Um, I have one in the back. Okay. So, he's 21, 21 old, and he's getting head drop. Mm -hmm. Would that be considered a. That could absolutely be a seizure. I would absolutely get that checked out. Definitely, definitely. It okay. doesn't have to be, but it could be. Because he was in Kepro before. Okay. And they changed it because he was getting aggressive. Yeah. So they changed it to Tokumat. Okay. So that's. On this one, he's starting with a Kepro and very. Yeah. So the seizure, if he was having seizures before and it was controlled with, with Kepro, but he became aggressive, which is a known side effect of Kepro. Okay. It is a known side effect of Kepro. It doesn't happen to everybody, but it can happen. So because of the pattern of seizure, it can change, so can his symptoms. So Tokamax might be controlling something, but maybe he needs another medicine. It's, we have many more medicines he can try. Because he was getting less and he's dating his Yeah. I'm not a pediatric epileptologist. I do see kids, and I, when I trained, I saw children. But I, I am, I'm sure there's more than two medicines for, for kids. And head drops can absolutely be epileptic events. I would check for that. I would check first. Um, I would do an EEG and try to catch it. And I know I'm pushing the EEG. It really helps to know what's really going on. It really helps treat them. So I would push for an EEG, and if it's truly seizures, I would aggressively treat them with medications. So they can change the medication? Absolutely. I would talk to his physician, of course, um, and I'm going to keep repeating that. Obviously, talk to your doctors. But absolutely, he, he, if he's only been on two medicines, he has not even started this, this path. Right. Okay, next question online. We'll do an online one. All right. Um, do you next? <laughs> Monica asks, my daughter is 18 and has had epilepsy uh, since an infant. It is possible. Is it possible to have seizures in autistic spectrum? Absolutely. Her triggers usually happen in crowded places or loud, busy environments. Yes, um, you can have seizures in also autistic spectrum. They have problems dealing with multiple sensory input, and they have they act out a lot as well. Uh, we go back to the the mantra I've been saying: "Let's find out if these are epileptic." The seizure medicines can make behaviors worse, and so. Putting her on seizure medicine or something that's not a seizure is rarely helpful. Um, yes, ma'am. Can the seizures result to paranoia or the medication he's on? Med medicine can trigger paranoia, yes, ma'am. And seizures can trigger paranoia also. And I have patients who I've treated in Amarillo. I don't know if Amarillo's logged in here. Is Amarillo logged in? Are they watching? I saw, I saw Lubbock. I haven't seen Amarillo. Amarillo. And there's a guy in Amarillo that yeah, I was treating before. He would get really paranoid and embarrassing after a seizure. He would keep ending up in jail. So I have to keep running notes to get him out of jail. <laughs> right? So, yes, yeah, seizures can trigger paranoia. post nickel paranoia and aggression is not uncommon. Um, but his fear is, is being alone or maybe. Yeah, it could night. actually be the seizure. It could absolutely be the seizure medicines. It could be either one. It could be either one. But it does. It's, it's, I've seen it most. I can't imagine that anybody who's practiced in epilepsy for more than a year is not. It definitely happens. Um, what's the risk with a greater than five minute absence seizure? So there is such a thing as a status of absence status of epilepticus. Um, and I know we don't see it in adults, so I can't really comment. I, I've only seen it once, and I know the, the neurologists I was working with at the time, they were at the Children's Hospital in Chicago. And they were all excited about it, so they were acting as though it was a clinical emergency. So 
I didn't see any clinical emergency. The vital signs were stable. The heart rate was stable. It was tachycardic. Our kids tend to be tachycardic, which is faster heart rates than adults. Um, what I worry about, and I'm reverting the question to something I can answer. When somebody has a convulsive seizure in the last five minutes, I worry about rhabdomyolysis fractures and continued uh, seizures. So of those three, the only thing that you would worry about in absence, they're not going to break anything and they're not going to get rhabdo. Rhabdomyolysis is muscle breakdown, it shouldn't be on the kids. Um, but if they continue to be in seizures, the longer you're in a seizure, the harder it is to break it. The longer you're in a seizure, the more likely you're to have, to have seizures in the future. So my, my guess would be the most likely um, concern is that if you're seizing for five minutes, then you're more likely to seize going forward. And if you're, you're seizing for five minutes, the harder it is to break it. I've had patients seize continuously for days in the past. And I can see that becoming a problem even with uh, even with um, absence seizures that otherwise are not physically dangerous. I guess well, I've been signaled that we're running out of time. Thank you everybody for listening. Um, it was a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, best of luck, I guess, that's it. Does Jose want to say anything? Yeah, um, so, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Hi. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up. Do you need me? No, yeah, and you're good. Um, as long as you stick around for a little bit. Bye. Yeah, for sure. All right, so again, my name is Jose. Uh, if anyone joined in uh, after we started, my name is Jose. I'm education coordinator and regional program coordinator with um, Epilepsy Foundation of Texas. Uh, Dr. Rashid is going to stick around. If you would like to visit our resource table, you're welcome. Um, Lloyd with UCB Pharmaceuticals brought some stuff as well. Uh, so uh, just some thank yous. Uh, we want to thank United Way and their Community Resource Center staff for the space and technology. Uh, we want to thank Lloyd with UCB uh, for the food. Uh, I want to thank my director, Rebecca. Uh, she was handling the tech behind the scenes. We definitely want to thank Dr. Rashid for putting his talk and presentation together. And uh, last but not least, we want to thank all of the participants that were here. Uh, without you, none of this is possible. We're here for you. We do this for you. Uh, so we need any and all feedback uh, as we strive to improve access to care for children and youth living with epilepsy. Um, so you'll find the uh, you'll find the evaluations at the last part of the folder. So that's about it. Uh, we thank you all very much. So feel free to go to the table. You can ask me any questions. Dr. Rashid is going to stick around. You can ask any questions. We'll finish with that. Uh, if anyone needs an evaluation, I have more. Just let me know. I have more evaluations back here.
Yeah, what's up, man? No, I should have. Do we record this for me? Or is it just one time live from the Uh Yeah, so it, it'll be recorded on. Uh, 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 yeah, I, I, I'm just putting one last uh, comment on here. Okay. Oh, um, flashing lights, maybe. So what are you playing on the That shouldn't have any good But hey, but not at night. Go to sleep at night, turn it off, go to sleep, right? Not at night. So, yes, that's what you have to do. The tablet will cause seizures because you're not sleeping, dude. Because I'm seeing the sleep. I know. It's, it's not the tablet. You can test, you don't put them on EMG, but you can play tablet, see if it happens. But, but it's sleep, you can sleep, because if he's playing tablet in his bed, that's like, yeah, sure, sure, okay. Yeah. No. But wait, midnight? Huh? Midnight, 10 o'clock, 8 o'clock. No, 8 o'clock, he goes, okay, yeah. good. <laughs> he does, no, he doesn't do the tablet, uh, maybe at 6 o'clock. Wait, what about, uh, so how do I end? Check with the conference, that oh, damn, did you end it on there? Um, like the 3D one? Yeah. Has it ended? Yes. I don't know yet. I don't know. The answer to that is I've been, been long enough for you to know. I don't know. That's my answer. <laughs> so, listen.